Number 10, Black Widow and Iron Man. A change in the Ultimate Universe that actually made sense in my head for some reason was the relationship between Tony Stark and Black Widow. Shortly after Iron Man joined the S.H.I.E.L.D. sponsored Ultimates team, he and Natalia Romanova struck up their relationship and it went so far the two eventually got engaged, with Tony even giving Black Widow her own nanite controlled suit of armor, which did look really cool by the way. But the happy couple didn't last too long as it turned out that Natalia was actually a traitor, working for the Liberators, which is a whole other thing we could talk about. After she turned on Tony, she managed to end the life of his longtime butler and close friend Jarvis. Kind of an unredeemable act there. So it didn't feel so bad when Tony used the nanites inside Natalia's body, the ones used to control that fancy new armor, to paralyze her and steal information from her brain about the Liberators and her betrayal. And then he knocks her unconscious with a wine bottle, giving her brain damage. There was also this whole raunchy video that got leaked of the two which just felt completely random to me but hey it happens. Number 9 Black Panther. A lot of stuff in the Ultimate Universe I can look past but I gotta say I don't like what they did to Black Panther here. You see in the Ultimate Universe T'Challa Udaku, the youngest son of King T'Chaka, when he became jealous of his older brother M'Baku who was set to take on the Panther Trials, T'Challa decided to secretly go do it himself. What are the Panther Trials? Well it basically involves hunting and defeating an actual panther in combat. So yeah, the young T'Challa ain't ready for that kind of thing, and he loses badly, with the panther actually tearing out T'Challa's throat. Being brought back to Wakanda, he undergoes 16 hours of surgery, and even then, the supposedly super advanced nation is not able to save him. So of course, they turn to the United States of America. Specifically, they turn to the super reliable Weapon X program. Now, Weapon X is able to save T'Challa, minus his vocal cords. But similar to Wolverine, they give him mutant abilities that enhance his strength, speed, stamina, agility, night vision, and they even give him retractable bone claws, and then give him the title of Black Panther. He is then put under the control of Nick Fury, who refuses to let him go back to Wakanda, makes him the property of the United States, and has him trained under Captain America. Now there is more to this story, but taking the awesome culture rich Wakandan hero and making him a sort of Wolverine clone who can't speak and is the property of the United States government just kind of feels wrong, man. Number 8, Victor Von What? This point is going to cover one very small thing. For the ultimate version of Doctor Doom, I honestly don't have much issue with the changes they implemented. The metal skin, the goat legs, the backstory change, even what they did to his kingdom. It's alright, I guess. For me. One thing I will not, cannot abide is changing his last name to have him seemingly related to a real world action star. Victor Van Dam? Van Dam? Why? Who do these buffoons think they are? Sorry, I'm getting a little worked up here. He was also way more of a petty character than he was an extremely dangerous villain. Luckily, that changed slightly before the ultimate run came to an end, but the damage was done. Let's just move on. Number 7, Blue Goo. Maybe this is more just really weird as opposed to a horrible moment, but thanks to sci-fi writer Orson Scott Card of Ender's Game fame, we got a version of Iron Man who, due to a virus that led to the passing of his mother and affected Tony upon his birth, lives in constant pain unless he's coated in this really strange blue goo created by his father which was developed as a sort of bio armor. It does the trick but it's still rather odd and fans were not fans of this change. Personally I think a lot of the changes made to Iron Man's backstory in the Ultimate Universe were really interesting and it was different from 616 which made it fun but the blue skin was an interesting choice to say the least. This point is a little unfair as Marvel decided to retcon on this out of his history, but that don't change the fact that it did indeed happen and it was rather strange too. Number 6, Hulk eating people. The Incredible Hulk has always sort of tiptoed the line between being a hero and being a monster. In the 616 universe, we can more often than not say he is a hero, but in the Ultimate Universe? Not a chance. For starters, his origin already starts Bruce Banner off on a bad foot. He is made to feel inferior by both his ex and other heroes, which is what spurs him to become the Hulk in order to feel bigger, I guess? Sounds like a super villain to me. That's because he basically is. After he transforms, he goes on a rampage through New York, taking out more than 800 people and even eating some of them. Sure, the idea haunts Bruce, which we learn in the Ultimate Hulk solo comic as he recounts the feeling of eating a person, but there isn't really a redemption here. Also, what the hell is up with the whole Freddie Prince Jr. thing? It's hilarious, but what? Number 5, the airport fight. Look. 
I know the MCU's Civil War was not on the same scale as it was in the comics. Not by a long shot. And yeah, 12 superheroes running at each other at an abandoned airport may seem silly to some, but for those of us who are fans, this battle was amazing. Seeing the heroes who we have seen battle other huge threats together battle each other with some huge new players joining the wider world of the MCU with Winter Soldier and Scott Lang finally being in an ensemble and with Black Panther and Spider-Man getting their MCU debuts, every hero got moments to shine and have some fun. The little scuffle between Spider-Man and the Falcon and the Winter Soldier and and even when he fought Cap was such a great display of why Tom Holland's Spider-Man is fantastic. Ant-Man had awesome moments taking on Black Widow, entering Tony's armor, and going giant sized. It was weirdly fun and yet intense and ended on a note that reminded everyone that this is all more serious than they've been taking it, leading to the much more emotionally weighted and awesome fight between Iron Man, Cap, and Bucky. At number 4 we have a more recent blunder from Thor Love and Thunder and that is the awful floating head CGI of Axel son of Heimdall. This is one of those moments that is slowly but surely becoming a meme online and for good reason. The movie had a budget of 250 million dollars and to see something this low effort tells us that either A the VFX teams were being heavily overworked. B, this scene was thrown in at the last minute and the CGI was rushed, or C, the filmmakers genuinely thought this was passable. Now, I do a bit of basic animation here and there, and what I find to be the worst part of the execution on this one is that the boy's face isn't even tracked along with the mask that was created to cut out his head. Meaning, when they grab the footage of the actor talking and cut his face out to place it in Thor's scene, you can tell Axel is swaying slightly. And instead of the artist accounting for the sway, part of his face gets cut off by the edge of the cutout, making it look like his head is getting skinnier and then wider back and forth. It's really a strange sight to see in such a massively funded project, and although I don't like to hate on the VFX teams too much because they're basically magicians who we often take for granted, this is not their proudest moment. Number 3. Open Your Eye In the first Doctor Strange movie, Stephen Strange is an arrogant and cocky world class surgeon who gets seriously humbled when he crashes his sports car while distractedly driving, ruining his hands. It causes the former surgeon to go off in search of any possible way of fixing his hands and returning to his life work. His search takes him as far as Nepal and Kathmandu where he finds the Kamar Taj, seeking a mystical form of healing which Strange passes off as hokey pseudoscience and a waste of his time. Well, time to be humbled again, Doctor. As the Ancient One played wonderfully by the ever amazing Tilda Swinton opens his eyes to the spectrum of the infinite universes, we get to witness possibly the wildest display of visual effects in a Marvel film ever. With Steven zipping across dimensions in his astral form, the entire sequence is a treat to the eyes and the mind with visuals that aren't easy to comprehend on first viewing. Even six years after the film's release, this scene still holds up against other VFX heavy moments in films that came after it. And I think another Doctor Strange special effects moment of greatness that deserves at least a mention is that awesome Doctor Strange vs Thanos fight in Infinity War. So awesome. At number 2 though is the time that I'm sure we're all familiar with which is when Quill loses his cool and screws everything up during the final battle with Thanos in Infinity War. This is one of the most infuriating moments not just in the MCU but in any movie I've ever seen. I get the argument that this is just part of Quill's character that he's liable to act on emotion but I still don't think this writing is justified because for Quill to hit Thanos like that and blow the operation on a whim isn't just emotional it's stupid. So stupid that it's not even believable that any character other than maybe Hulk would do something like this ever. Now hear me out. I'm not saying that Quill shouldn't have screwed up the plan at that moment. I get that he's a big player in this climax after what happens to Gamora. But what I think they should have done was have Quill find out about Gamora before the battle and then in a fit of anger secretly prepare what he thinks to be a foolproof plan to kill Thanos himself. And when this moment comes he would foolishly enact that plan which of course would fail and then the movie would continue. I mean I'm not saying I'm smarter than the writers or anything but I just think this moment was made to be too frustrating. I'd at least like to see Quill face some kind of scrutiny for this mistake in upcoming MCU stories. I mean, come on. 
And in at number one is Avengers Assemble. Not to sound too much like a nerd or anything, but I went to see Endgame by myself at a viewing early in the day because I figured the theater would be less packed. This was the week the movie released, so I was dumb to think that. The theater was full, but it didn't stop me enjoying the movie, and it definitely didn't stop the involuntary wave of feeling like both crying and laughing when in the climax of the movie, when the odds just stacked themselves up against the remaining Avengers, when the alternate timeline Thanos attacked after they had assembled the Infinity Stones. We see Steve standing alone against Thanos' forces, only for a radio static to come in on his earpiece as Sam Wilson tunes in on your left. And a sorcerer's portal slowly opens up, revealing T'Challa, Shuri, and Okoye, waltzing on in. That small glimmer of hope is enough to bring a tear to your eye. But then the small glimmer becomes an outstanding wave of relief, happiness, and spectacle as a whole damn army of every single hero plus the combined forces of sorcerers, as guardians, Wakandans, and Ravagers, and more, all come pouring through multiple various portals in a huge sweeping sequence culminating in Steve calling Mjolnir to him as he yells, Avengers! And as the scene goes quiet, he utters the last three syllables that fans have been waiting for ever since the first Avengers movie hit screens in 2012. Assemble. Sparking one of the most awesome battles in MCU history. I literally had goosebumps just typing this. Number 10, Thor and Hela. Starting off with an example of why the Ultimate Universe does some unnecessary stuff from time to time, Thor was forced to kill his supervillain son to save America from civil war. But what's funny, well not funny, is that wasn't even the unnecessary part. So it begins in the aftermath of an event called Ultimatum, which we will get to much later on. Basically, Ultimate Thor ends up sacrificing sacrificing his own life to save his lover, Valkyrie. While in the afterlife, in order to be reunited with and save Valkyrie, the goddess Hela makes Thor fight a whole army of undead soldiers, which he does. But then Thor asks what else he needs to do, and this goddess just starts undressing herself and demanding that Thor gives her a baby. Which of course he does, and it doesn't even save Valkyrie. This comes back later with the child, Modi Thorson, being raised by a much more villainous Loki, feeling abandoned and seeing seeking revenge, trying to turn America into a new Asgard while wielding an infinity stone and forcing Thor to eventually strike down his own evil son. Number 9. Look what they did to my boy! Almost everyone loves Deadpool. Weirdly, even some moms love Deadpool. So when the gritty, realistic, mature Ultimate Universe was going to bring the character in, you'd expect it to be a match made in heaven. No! I blame this version of the character for the monstrosity we got three years later in 2009's X-Men Origins Wolverine. The Ultimate Marvel version of Deadpool was a sergeant in the military named Wadey Wilson. He's grim, he's angry, he's way too serious, and he also is an incredibly racist mutant hater. Oh, he was also a cyborg with incredible strength, he retained his signature healing factor, and instead of just being disfigured, he had no skin at all. And he's missing part of his skull, so his head is instead encased in a clear plastic case for everyone to see. Deadpool leads the Reavers, who are also racist, in trying to kill prominent mutants. Thankfully, Ultimate Deadpool was taken off the board by the 616 Deadpool in Deadpool Kills Deadpool in 2013. Number 8. Hank Pym needs to chill. Hank Pym has not really ever been that great of a dude. He has multiple untreated mental disorders and crazy insecurities that have caused him to do multiple not so great things in his time in the regular universe. But of course, everything in the Ultimate Universe gets ramped up a bit. Pym got involved in a very heated argument with his wife, Janet Van Dyne, over her friendship with Captain America. In Ultimate's issue number 6, things start to get physical, until the Wasp shrinks down to her smaller size to get away from her husband. Unfortunately, the terribly insecure Hank cornered her and sprayed her Wasp-sized self with bug spray. She hid under a desk to catch her breath after inhaling the toxic fumes, while her husband just kept on with the emotional bombardment. But he didn't stop there. He then sent an army of ants after her until he realized what he was doing to his own wife. This stuff kind of boils my blood just a little bit. The fight resulted in Janet's very near death, her hospitalization, and his expulsion from the Ultimates. Number 
7. Making the Maker The Fantastic Four in the Ultimate Universe remained relatively the same, at least in their family dynamics. Their backstory was slightly modified, but overall the four main heroes lived as you'd expect, until it all went Marvel Ultimate E. First off, Sue Storm and Reed Richards lost a child together. But then Reed Richards proposed to Susan Storm and she rejected his proposal. Just like that, the Fantastic Four was no more, but that's not the end. What came next, really quickly I might add, was Reed going absolutely bonkers, faking his death, de-lifing his family, planning alien terror plots around the world, being trapped in the negative zone where he primed his intellect by stretching his brain and skull, and he built an army. Since he was horribly burnt by the Human Torch, Reed took to wearing a helmet and founded the Children of Tomorrow, the Dark Ultimates, and he called himself the Maker. He became an incredibly evil Reed Richards. Number six. Cap hates France? Look, despite the name, Captain America, Steve Rogers, is very much a protector of the world, not just America. So it was really odd when in Ultimates number 12 from Mark Miller, Brian Hitch, and Paul Neary, we see the ultimate Marvel Universe Captain America verbally wailing on France, of all places. Captain America is caught in a fight with Herr Kleiser, an old German rival. Just for better context, Nick Fury is there too. Captain America is obviously the hero though, so eventually he gets the upper hand. It was just so odd that when Kleiser was pinned by Cap and asking for surrender, well, Cap digs his shield into the dude's stomach and says, Surrender? Surrender? You think this letter on my head stands for France? The comment was kind of fueled by the time period it was written in, as the states were entering into a war and France refused to join them, leading to some anti-France feelings in the real world. But this World War II era dig at the country left a bad taste in pretty much everyone's mouth, especially from a character that is supposed to be much, much better than that. At number 5 is the seminal moment of Barry Allen's mother's death. Cited as a pivotal moment in the Flash's origin story, the death of Nora Thompson, Barry's mother, marks one of the worst moments in The Flash's history by a long shot. And to make things worse, Barry Allen's own father is framed for the crime, which leaves the future hero orphan during most of his childhood. Later in The Flash storyline, it's revealed that the murderer had actually been Reverse Flash and not his father, which only makes the whole event that much more confusing and devastating. The only reason why this moment isn't higher on the list is that it's arguably one of the reasons why The Flash becomes as powerful and influential as he does. Humanity gets a lot of good out of this event in a strange, twisted sort of way, so I just pushed it a bit back on the list. At number four is the time that The Flash mind wipes the entire world. When he realizes that he'd be much safer if no one knew his secret identity, he decides that he should go back on his previous decision to reveal who he is to the world. So he approaches Hal Jordan and asks to wipe the minds of, well, everyone on Earth. It's such a powerful mind wipe that even he forgets that he was ever the Flash in the first place for a time. But all in all, in the comic book world, it is pretty frowned upon to wipe people's memories for obvious reasons. So this makes it higher on the list. It's not quite as bad since he targeted only the memories regarding him as the Flash, but still, it's not one of the most respectable moves by the speedster. At number three is the time when the Flash drives the top insane. During the Identity Crisis event, the infamous villain The Top, worst name, is the subject of an experiment. Barry Allen wants to see if he can mind wipe the bad out of this bad guy. He gets Zatanna to mind wipe him, leaving him kind of like a good guy after the procedure. But soon after, the now good guy, the top, starts to remember his past evil deeds and basically goes insane. His guilt surmounts to a point where he pretty much ends his own life. This is another instance of the Flash playing around with mind wiping without considering the consequences, but it's not entirely his fault in my opinion. He was just trying to give the top a chance of being better. At number two is the death of Iris. The longtime love interest of the Flash, Iris West Allen, has been around throughout the many different iterations of the Flash. And even though they have a pretty rocky relationship at times, Iris' death comes as a shock to not only the readers, but to the Flash as well. And you best believe that it's once again at the hands of Reverse Flash. Literally at his hands, he pushes his hands into Iris' forehead and basically scrambles her brains. 
killing her instantly. This leaves Barry Allen in shambles naturally and although we do see Iris make a return later on in the comics, this event is hugely pivotal for the Flash, changing him forever and strengthening his hatred for Reverse Flash in the process. At number 1 is the one and only Flashpoint. Not only is this one of the most significant events in the Flash's life, but it's also considered one of the worst things to happen to the whole DC universe. After he's brought back to life in Final Crisis, the Flash decides he needs to go back in time to prevent the death of his mother. But once again, we see Barry Allen lacking foresight with the consequences of not mind wipe this time, but time travel. And when he returns to the present, the whole world has changed. Most of the world is destroyed due to a war between Wonder Woman and Aquaman. Superman is now a secret government prisoner and Batman is dead instead of his father, leaving Thomas Wayne as a murderous version of Batman. The Flash then has to go back in time and undo the events of Flashpoint, which sparks the beginning of the New 52, but for some time there, The Flash instigates one of the most damaging events in The Flash's and all of the DC Comics history. Number 10, The Fate of Squid Boy Squid Boy and his friendship with Juggernaut was one of the redeeming elements of Chuck Austin's run on the X-Men, which is pretty widely disliked among fans of the X-Men. Austin's run is also the one that featured the relationship which was highly controversial between Husk and Angel. However, one of the things that was pretty cool about his run was how Juggernaut was brought into the book and somewhat redeemed. Juggernaut even befriended Sammy, known as Squid Boy, a young mutant who was ridiculed at school for his appearance and came to join the Xavier Institute. Squid Boy would save Juggernaut's life and the two would become friends, with Kane even becoming like a father to Squid Boy, whose own father mistreated him as Kane's once had. Despite them both protecting one another, at one point Squid Boy stumbles upon a meeting that Juggernaut is attending with the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. <gasps> Look gasp. Tragically, Squid Boy did not know that Juggernaut was acting as a double agent for the X-Men. Causing a scene and accusing Juggernaut of being a traitor, Black Tom Cassidy reacted by killing the young mutant. What an end to that initially sweet and uplifting story. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list, be sure to give it a like and let us know down below what you think one of the worst moments in X-Men history is. Both in in terms of controversy or just in terms of bad things that have happened to mutants. Number 9. Beasts Not So Subtle Disguise At one point the X-Men get kidnapped and brainwashed by Mesmero, forced to join the circus. At the time, Hank wasn't even really with the X-Men, but was instead a member of the Avengers. But when he answers a call from the mutants and finds the X-Mansion deserted, he still of course looks for his fellow friends and former and future comrades. While searching, Beast decides to adopt a disguise. This is already after Beast is covered in bright blue fur, so what disguise? Guys, does he go for French coat and a hat? You got it. Even stranger, for the most part, his disguise actually works. It's only after his hat is removed that even the brainwashed X-Men seem to realize that there's something weird going on with his appearance. Don't worry though, despite the fact that Hank is kinda awful at disguises in this story, he's still a brilliant and dexterous fellow who is able to help save the X-Men in the end. Number 8. Avengers vs X-Men Avengers vs X-Men pitted two superhero groups both known for doing massive good and saving the world on multiple, countless occasions really against one another. How do you even make these two groups fight one another? Enter the Phoenix Force. Avengers and X-Men to decide to take one another on because they disagree on what to do with the Phoenix Force, which is headed to Earth to merge with its current ideal host, Hope Summers, the mutant messiah. The X-Men want to protect Hope, but also think the Phoenix could be useful, while the Avengers think the cosmic power is too dangerous and should be destroyed. All in all, Avengers vs X-Men created a lot of problems, especially for the X-Men going forward. It also is a big part of the the later split between Storm and Black Panther, who were actually married at the time. While the X-Men and Mutant Kind were at least mostly united in this front, although you know Wolverine had some conflicting feelings of his own about it, Avengers vs X-Men was also considered to be one of the greatest clashing of ideals since the first Civil War event from 2006. Number 7. Fox Fox was one of the weirdest X-Men to have never really existed, and also was pretty creepy considering the moves she put on Gambit. Fox attempted to seduce Gambit away from Rogue at a time when the couple were having some pretty intense intimacy problems. I mean, Rogue and Gambit have had intimacy problems physically for years in the comics, but I'm talking about intimacy on really all levels, including emotional intimacy. Emma Frost at the time was trying to provide a sort of couples counseling for them and offer them a free space psychically for them to um, connect romantically in ways they couldn't in the physical world at that time. Fox played on Gambit's struggles, flirting with him and offering herself physically to him. One, this was pretty messed up as Fox was actually a mutant student of his and 
two, it was really messed up because it was later revealed that Fox actually wasn't a student at all, didn't really exist, but was actually Rogue's adoptive mother, Mystique, in disguise, who didn't believe that Gambit was good enough for her daughter and later claimed to have been testing Gambit. Number six, Cyclops kills Professor X. Now, granted, this also happened as a result of the Avengers vs. X Men story arc. Cyclops ended up killing Professor X because he was possessed by the Phoenix Force and ultimately had so much power with him that it basically corrupted him. But this was also not a great time for Professor X in comic book history. So, even if you disagree with Cyclops, actions here, and I think most people do, I think you can at least understand why this happened. This was following a time where many dark truths about Xavier and his lies to the X-Men were unearthed. Among them was the sentience of the Danger Room, itself an AI cyborg mutant, as well as the revelation in Deadly Genesis that Xavier had sent Moira McTaggart's mutant team into Krakoa only for them to perish quote unquote perish. A truth which Vulcan forced the professor to confess. Professor X was on a path of redemption at the time of his death at the hands, or rather optic blasts of Cyclops, but he was still overshadowed by a pretty dark time in his own history. At number five, I'm putting the time when Peter loses his parents again. Well, he doesn't really lose them twice, but he goes through the experience of losing them twice. When both his parents seem to make a sudden and mysterious reappearance, Peter Parker can't help but be ecstatic. He's told that they'd been held captive in Algeria his whole life at the hands of Red Skull and that they were back and here to stay. But right as Peter finally comes around and accepts this as the truth, it gets revealed that they aren't his parents at all, but androids created by Chameleon, a plan orchestrated by Harry Osborn. Spider-Man gets seriously traumatized by this and has a nervous breakdown. And what's worse is that somehow in the same instance, Aunt May learns about Peter's identity as Spider-Man, complicating and changing his life even further. At number four is one of the classics that we all know about, the murder of Uncle Ben. This is the seminal awful moment in Spider-Man history and couldn't be left off the list because it's what drives Peter Parker to become who he becomes. In a way, I wanted to put this one further back on the list because it also brings a lot of good to the innocent people of the world and to fans of Spider-Man's work. It also brought us all the iconic saying, with great power comes great responsibility, which sort of transcends the Spider-Man comics entirely. So I wanted to put this entry at number nine or even 10, but then I thought about how it made Peter Parker himself feel and I realized maybe that was a little selfish for me. So. It's at number four. This event takes place way back in Amazing Fantasy issue 15 in 1962, which also marks the first time we see Spider-Man make his debut. At number three, we have the time when, trigger warning again, Peter Parker gives Mary Jane cancer in the Spider-Man Reign miniseries. And the way this happens makes it even more brutal. In fact, so brutal, I, I won't even spell it out here because this channel needs to say PG. So you can Google it if you wanna know the details, but I will do my best. Basically, in a distant, gritty, alternate future, we're introduced to a world where an elderly Peter Parker is struck with guilt over his accidental killing of Mary Jane. But this isn't because of some successful attempt on her life by a supervillain, nor did Spider-Man accidentally drop her from a rooftop or something like that. Let's just say that while being intimate with her, he didn't realize that certain properties that came in contact with MJ turned out to be so radioactive as a result of his powers that it made her sick. And after too many instances of this radioactive contact, MJ got so sick that she passed away. So, there we go. At number two, we have the classic, the iconic, the horribly iconic, like iconic in a bad way, death of the MCU Peter Parker in Infinity War. Now, Peter Parker gets killed at the hands of Thanos in both the comics and the movies, but it's pretty much unanimous that the MCU moment is a lot sadder all around. We all know how brutal it was to watch such a young iteration of Peter Parker fade away at the end of the movie in the way that he does. And even though that isn't actually the end for Spider-Man, it is a really shocking reminder that even the most lovable and seemingly untouchable heroes can meet an end on a dime like this. It's just a bleak moment and one that will always be known as one of the worst moments in Spider-Man history. Finally at number one is the gut-wrenching moment when Spider-Man accidentally kills 
Gwen Stacy in The Amazing Spider-Man number 121. When she's kidnapped by the Green Goblin and taken to the Brooklyn Bridge, Norman Osborn lets go and we all watch her fall to her death. But Spider-Man gets to her just in time, so he thinks, spinning a web that catches her ankle and stops her mid-fall. Although we all know what happens next, which ends up haunting Peter Parker for years to come. The whiplash that Gwen's body experiences from the sudden change in velocity snaps her neck, killing her instantly. Although this isn't actually Spider-Man's fault, it can be seen how something like this could plague someone's existence with guilt for the rest of their life. And to be easier on Spidey, the Green Goblin does claim that the fall would have killed Gwen before she hit the ground anyway, meaning that possibly her neck didn't break, but the idea online is that her neck breaks from the whip, whiplash and I haven't seen it any other way. So that's what I'm sticking with. I, I, I wish it wasn't that way, but it seems like that's what happens. Either way, this is a horribly iconic moment in the comics and probably the first thing that a real Spidey fan thinks of when they're asked to name one of the worst moments in Spider-Man history. At number 10, we have the moment from Age of Ultron when Bruce Banner falls on Black Widow's chest. During the epic introduction to Ultron, what was going to be an epic high stakes battle becomes a little less cool when they throw some cheap slapstick into the mix. As Bruce and Natasha narrowly miss a laser blast and go flying over the bar, Bruce's face goes right into her chest. And although these jokes are sometimes funny here and there, the trope is tired at this point and comes off as pretty aged and corny. I get it that there's some budding sexual tension between Bruce and Natasha by this point, but I feel like they could have put it in a scene before or after this epic battle, not during the first major confrontation of the movie. And maybe a little awkward accidental hand touch, not a full face to the chest joke. I don't know, that's just me. Number nine, I am Iron Man. Both times. Not including Edward Norton's Incredible Hulk, Robert Downey Jr. kicked off the MCU with a bang that almost no one expected in 2008's Iron Man. He killed it as Iron Man, being the heart of the MCU for the next 11 years until the character self-sacrificed to save the universe and defeat Thanos in 2019's Avengers Endgame. He ended that first film by embracing his new superhero persona in a very big screw it moment when he told the whole world, I am Iron Man. With the credits coming in with awesome some Black Sabbath music. It was almost too perfect. To bring it all to an end though, stealing the Infinity Stones off of Grimace's big purple fist and responding to his inevitability with the simple phrase he kicked this all off with. A beautiful moment to finish off the greatest threat any of the superheroes had ever faced and a perfect comeback to a statement that proved to be pretty inaccurate. At number eight is the destruction of Xandar in Infinity War. Now, I love Infinity War, but one of my main criticisms of the movie has always been been that it's too hard to track how Thanos gets all the Infinity Stones. In the comics, this is obviously explored across multiple issues and for good reason. It is essential to the payoff of Thanos carrying out his final plan. But in the movie, this process isn't quite given the respect it needs and especially not in regards to the Power Stone. The way that the stone is acquired by Thanos is when he steals it from the planet Xandar, which he of course destroys in the process. But not only do we not get to see any of this happen, it's just told to us in passing by Thor. And on top of that, the Guardians of the Galaxy don't even really react, or at least not how they should have, considering they've just gotten done protecting the now non-existent planet. I understand that the movie needed to be kept short, but all of the other stones get their own full scenes, exploring how they were acquired by Thanos. And the Power Stone, which probably has the most canonical significance by this point in the MCU, save maybe the Space Stone, just gets a passing remark. All I can say to that is, well, rest in peace to the Xandarians. Number seven, Hulk fighting Iron Man. The question of which heroes the Incredible Hulk can defeat is always an incredibly fun topic. He usually plants incredible scenarios with some of the strongest beings in comicdom, but one person who is often overlooked is Iron Man. Now granted, in the comic universe, there is almost no chance that Iron Man will come out on top in a fight against the Hulk. It may be a long fight, depending on the Stark tech being used, but I digress. The MCU gave us a good look at why Iron Man is no pushover when it pitted 
unlimited a raged off the hinges Hulk against the newly unveiled Hulk Buster armor created by Tony Stark. This fight is awesome. First off, the high octane speed of it keeps it engaging literally the whole time. Secondly, it perfectly shows how much of a threat the Hulk can actually pose and how absolutely terrifying he actually is. And thirdly, bouncing off of that, Robert Downey Jr. shows us both how utterly terrifying it would be to fight a monster like the Hulk in a suit of armor while still remaining incredibly hilarious and delivering every line with a perfect mix of fear, humor, and high stress that the 4 minute and 20 second scene deserves. And bonus points for the end of the scene when the Hulk slash Bruce Banner finally sees the amount of destruction and pain he has caused lets us into his mind just enough to feel bad until Iron Man knocks him out cold. At number 6 is the origin of Nick Fury's missing eye in Captain Marvel. As much as I love the relatively newer Waititian approach to the MCU where everything is laden with quips and goofs, this is an example of when the jokes can just go a bit too far. The first time I saw this was in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 with Drax's overused literalness and well, I think it's fair to say that Love and Thunder just wasn't serious enough. But one moment in particular that demonstrates how jokes can sometimes ruin things in the MCU is when we see that Nick Fury loses his eye to a CGI cat named Goose, who simply just scratches it. This is seen as a throwaway insert that didn't really need to be there and honestly isn't even played off that well in Jackson's acting. Now I realize this is obviously meant to poke fun at the question of where his eye patch is in these earlier days, but personally I feel like there was room to actually explore a cooler, more epic backstory as to how Fury gets his eye patch. But instead it was thrown away with the bathwater entirely in my opinion in a manner that I felt was unneeded and a little too silly. Number 5. Cyclops and Emma Frost make out on Jean Grey's grave. Oh boy. Yeah, there are a lot of things that have not been great when it comes to um, Cyclops' history. Sorry Cyclops. I love you Scott, but you do some questionable things man. I mean, he's done a lot of good things, but he's also been part of some of the biggest scandals in all of mutant history. Case in point, his psychic affair with Emma Frost, and following that, his making out on Jean's grave with Emma after Jean had died. Wolverine certainly was not impressed with any of this. While many still ship and love Cyclops and Emma together, even many of the fans of the couple would agree it was was a pretty weird moment. However, Jean's ghost gave the couple her blessing, so I guess we're just supposed to be cool with it. I mean, I guess if Jean's ghost is fine with it, then we're just supposed to be like, yeah, all right, why not? Make out on that grave. You guys are in love. It's cool. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to see a part two, because you know we have there's a lot of terrible things that have happened in X-Men history. Please be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 4. Professor X and Jean Grey In particular, Professor X's initial feelings about Jean back in the Stan Lee, Jack Kirby days of the X-Men. We all know that Cyclops aka Scott Summers has always had a thing for Jean, but when it comes to the classic X-Men team, he actually wasn't the only one. In fact, pretty much everyone was head over heels for Jean at one point. Maybe except Bobby, who back in the day did like to flirt, but mainly was in love with ice cream. I mean, Bobby was the youngest of the bunch, and even me, not necessarily being the youngest of any bunch, I still love ice cream, so fair enough Bobby. You you eat that ice cream. Both Angel and Beast also seem to hold a bit of a flame for the lone female member of the X-Men team at that time, with Angel actually being pretty close at times to winning Jean's heart. But that's not where it ended. Even Charles Xavier, Jean's mentor and teacher, was apparently in love with her? Why is this so bad? While at the time the X-Men came across as more young adults at times than teenagers, in retrospect it would be established that Charles, as a grown man, had come to Jean's aid when her powers first manifested and shielded her from them with mental blocks to protect her from basically the sheer power that would otherwise probably like have destroyed her. So she was maybe 8 or 10 I think when this happened and he was an adult? Okay. Add in the fact that even back in the 60s run, Charles was her professor and Jean was his student, and the fact that Professor X chiefly blamed his lack of ability to walk as a reason why he couldn't, nay shouldn't, be with Jean. And it's all kind of weird and pretty gross. Look, Charles, you don't have to walk for people to love you, but also don't have crushes on your students. It's weird. Number 3. Archangel and Husk 
One of the strangest relationships to have ever existed in the X books. One of. Or at the very least, one of the most controversial was the one between Archangel and Husk. Why was it considered so weird? Well, Angel was one of the first ever X Men on the original team back in the 60s. Now, time works weird in comics, I'll grant you that, but Husk was known to be the younger sister of Cannonball, who himself was a much later addition to the X Men, first appearing almost 20 years after Angel on the New Mutants team in 1982. And Husk, Paige Guthrie, his younger sister, appeared two years later in 1984. She was believed to be in her late teens or maybe her early 20s? Well, Angel, although somewhat ageless, would likely be in his 30s at least, if not older, because yeah, he was around in the 60s, so we gotta do some fixing to make that make sense. And it was implied that he was quite a bit older throughout their relationship as well, just in the comics, in the context of the relationship and what they would say to each other. Add in the fact that these two got busy in the sky above the Guthrie family home, and yeah, you, you can see why this feels really problematic and weird. Number 2. X-Men Gold Controversy Oh boy, the X-Men Gold Controversy. X-Men Gold was actually a series that many X-Men fans were really excited for at the time. It promised a fresh, new take on X-Men the fans were craving, but when it came out, the first issue's release was swept up in a whirlwind of controversy in regards to its first printing. This was because the artist, Artie Nsayev, who was said to have hidden political symbolism in the issue, which directly related to a protest in Indonesia against the Christian governor of Jakarta, known as AHA. Overall, the protest was considered to be quite conservative in regards to political sides, and those protesting Ahok wanted him jailed for being a blasphemer when he referred to a passage in the Quran during his campaign. Now he apologized for doing so, but people were still really angry about it. And Saif was supposedly among those at the protest, and decided to include the political and religiously charged numbers in the first issue of the book, which are also said to stand for a passage that is interpreted in Indonesia speaking against accepting Jews or Christians as Muslim leaders. So even though apparently there were a lot of things that were misconstrued with all of that, it still was just not great. It's not great. Number one, Genosian Mutant Massacre. The history of Genosha has pretty much been tumultuous and widely awful since the start. The island nation prospered for most of its history thanks to mutants who were born there and once identified had their free will stripped of them, all their rights taken away, and were basically used as free laborers for the benefit of the nation, no longer being considered citizens but the property of the Genosian government once they were identified as mutants. Pretty terrible stuff. Eventually, the mutants on the island would rise up with some help, but even after that, it would not be easy to set things right. There was a lot of fighting that happened on Genosha, even after the mutants were kind of trying to get their rights back. At one point, Magneto got ownership of the island nation and attempted to turn it into a nation for mutant kind, a place mutants could call their own, reclaiming it and turning it into a little slice of paradise for them. An attempt at what we have kind of with Krakoa today. Hopefully it ends better for Krakoa though. For Genosha, millions of mutants were murdered on the island after it was attacked by Cassandra Nova's wild sentinels. It was a brutal and dark moment in mutant history, with the island being put on quarantine so that even even those who did survive and tried to get away were ordered to be shot on sight. A lot of people like to focus on House of M and M Day, but Genosha was a mass extinction mutant event and it was a really brutal attack. At number 10 is the time that the Flash is forced to fight his partner and childhood best friend August Hart aka Godspeed. Godspeed is a villain who kills speedsters and for a long time Barry Allen doesn't realize that someone so close to him is behind the mask. Godspeed's motivations start relatively understandably with him searching for revenge against the man who kills his brother. But as it typically goes with bad guys, August goes a bit off the rails and takes on the philosophy that killing is the answer to stopping evil. When Barry finally realizes the true identity of Godspeed, he has no other choice but to fight him, marking one of the sadder moments in the history of the Flash. Luckily however, Godspeed eventually reforms himself and teams up with Barry to fight Paradox in a high stakes battle. Still though, this is a pretty rough moment for the Flash all things considered. At number 9 is the time when the Flash joins evil Superman in the Injustice storyline. When Superman goes evil and splits up the Justice League in the pursuit of world domination, the Flash actually joins him. And it takes a while for him to realize that he's made an error in judgment. Superman even kills Shazam at one point and this still doesn't change the Flash's mind about the intentions of their mutiny. Now the idea of the Flash turning evil seems like a really bad moment and you 
might be thinking it deserves a higher spot on the list, but considering this event subverts the moral standpoints of multiple characters at once, it doesn't quite have the same impact as if, let's say, The Flash turned bad on his own. I see the Injustice event as being its own standalone case that shouldn't really reflect too seriously on The Flash's overall track record. I mean, Superman changes first. It's hard not to follow in the footsteps of the most powerful superhero on Earth. At number 8 is the time when the Flash turns inertia into a sentient statue. At one point, Bart Allen, Barry Allen's grandson, ages to a full adulthood and drops the mantle of Kid Flash, taking on the role of Scarlet Speedster and then eventually the Flash himself. But his time as the Flash is short-lived when the rogues and Inertia team up to kill him. When Wally West takes back the mantle, he immediately hunts down Inertia. And then when he learns that the teen villain isn't even remotely sorry for what he's done, Wally West freezes him, turning him into a statue. But this doesn't kill him either, which I can't tell if that's a good thing or a bad thing, because he still has all his senses and he's totally conscious. Wally puts Inertia into the Flash Museum, leaving him there for years to come, forcing him to watch visitors pass by and observe him as though he's some old dusty relic in a museum. This is a pretty brutal punishment, putting into question whether or not it's even worse than just killing the guy, although it honestly feels pretty deserved, we can't help but think there was maybe another way to handle this one. At number 7 is the time when the Flash forces Zoom to relive his worst memory over and over again. This is the result of Zoom attacking Wally West's wife, Linda, and hitting her with a sonic boom that kills her unborn child. Now you can imagine at this point, the Flash's whole moral compass would come into question. The whole superhero code of no killing becomes more of a roadblock than ever here, so Wally decides to take a workaround. When he finally catches Zoom, he freezes the pesky villain in a single moment in time, forcing Zoom to watch the worst day of his life on repeat for the rest of eternity. Now, I don't know what happens when we die, but if it's anything other than being forced to relive your worst memory over and over again, I'd imagine Zoom was wishing that Wally had just broken that old superhero code just this once. At number 6 is the time when the Flash dies during the Crisis on Infinite Earths storyline. In a moment of sacrifice, Barry Allen uses his powers to dismantle the Anti-Monitor's Anti-Matter Cannon, but in doing so, he essentially runs himself into a skeleton, moving so fast that he dissolves before everyone's eyes. But it works, leaving the Anti-Monitor with no other options in that moment, and when he thinks he'd otherwise won the day and defeated the heroes of planet Earth. Although this is a very sad and awful moment for the Flash, it's also one of his best moments as well, in a way. It shows everyone how far Barry Allen would go to save his fellow teammates and the people of the world, which kind of evens out how devastating his death is. If he died and any other way more tragically, this would be at number one. But the context of his sacrifice sort of lightens the blow on this one for me. Number five, Wolverine. Why are you so weird? Look, I'm gonna get into all the weirdness that is the Ultimate Universe Wolverine in a sec, but one thing that kind of immediately sticks out is how this version of Wolverine seems to repeatedly swing for ladies that are a little below his age bracket. Or like a lot below. And always redheads, which I guess kind of checks out from the 616 version too. Jean Grey, Firestar, and the one we're talking about today, Mary Jane Watson. In Ultimate Spider-Man number 66, Wolverine and Peter Parker end up switching bodies after Wolverine makes some unwanted advances on the teenage Jean Grey who psychically swapped their bodies. I don't know why she did that, but she did it. Wolverine finds some drawbacks, but apparently they pale in comparison to the perk that is the teenage Peter's girlfriend, Mary Jean. Wolverine tells MJ that he, in Peter's body, doesn't need to go to school while also making some crude advances towards her as well. It comes off as kind of creepy and really cringy. Number four, Wolverine. How you die. Now on the topic of Wolverine, he himself has quite a few moments that make him kind of awesome and some that make him kind of horrible. Ultimate Wolverine is no longer feral and he does not have the classic healing factor. Instead, he gets the survival factor, which is kind of a heck of a lot better. He can survive a heck of a lot, almost anything. Shield chopped his body off, leaving only his head and he breathed through his skin. They put his head in a vacuum and he went into stasis. Hulk ripped his body and threw it into to another mountain range and when Wolverine found that half, it was still fresh, no organ failure, no rot, and the blood was somehow still pumping. And he just
just put himself back together again with no issues. Ultimate Wolverine is unkillable by any means, no matter what you do. It was also implied that Ultimate Wolverine was the precursor of all mutants. He was sort of the first mutant in the world. So all the other mutants are basically products of Weapon X experimentation on Wolverine. On top of that, his blood could be synthesized into a substance that gives mutants insane power boosts. Marvel made Ultimate Wolverine insanely overpowered and then they absolutely killed him in the stupidest way possible. He died because Magneto did a hand wave thingamajig, as someone on Reddit said. And apparently, he destroyed every single one of Wolverine's cells while ripping out his adamantium. Number three, is this Game of Thrones? If you haven't noticed by some of the previous points, Marvel did a lot of unnecessary sexualizing of the Ultimate Universe. And to just push it a bit further into unnecessary odd choices made by Marvel for this universe, they included the incestuous relationship between the characters of Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver. Somehow it actually feels worse than the one in Game of Thrones, maybe just because it was extremely shocking and the two characters never had anything even similar to this in the 616 continuity. Fans wondered whether it was really necessary for Mark Miller to pair the two characters together and question whether the twist added anything new to the story at all. Answer, it didn't. Probably the biggest issue with this revelation is that now the characters can't so much as look at each other without fans accusing the writers of returning to the incest plot from the Ultimate X-Men. Number two. Blob. After the events of that ultimatum thing, which I'm so close to talking about, many heroes were taken out and or unaccounted for. One such hero would be Janet Van Dyne, the Wasp. Now, as we know, Hank Pym, Ant-Man, was kind of the worst. And though a terrible husband, he still diligently looked for his missing wife. What he found instead was the villain the Blob feasting on her remains. It's probably one of the most striking images from the whole Ultimate Universe, but it just gets stranger and somehow worse. Enraged at the sight of it, Ant-Man converted to his giant man state and picked up the Blob in his giant hand and bit Blob's head clean off and spat it on the ground to the shock and horror of his teammates. And in at number one is Ultimatum. Ultimatum Ultimatum was supposed to be how the writers finished off the Ultimate Universe stories. Obviously it didn't turn out that way, but as you can tell from previous points, writers kind of just went a little haywire with things they would do with a dying universe story. Basically, Magneto, who has been a pretty brutal villain in this universe so far, goes even farther during the mega event where stakes were way high. Basically, after Magneto gains control of the Hammer of Thor and is manipulated by none other than Doctor Doom, he messes with the magnetic pillars of the world, flipping them on their head and sending weather into a frenzy. The big event was a giant tsunami called the Ultimatum Wave that basically put New York underwater and brought a giant casualty list along with it. Bruce Banner drowns but the Hulk lives, the Wasp gets eaten as mentioned before, and Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch are killed off. In a bit more of a divisive move, while the X-Men are looking for their fallen teammates in the wake of the tidal wave in New York, Magneto pays a visit to Professor X and in a pretty brutal scene, snaps the Professor's neck. Magneto Magneto also rips the adamantium from Wolverine's skeleton and pretty much disintegrates him like we talked about before. At number 10 is when Spider-Man has his eye ripped out and eaten. Starting off the list on a light note, this moment comes from a 2005 storyline called The Other, in which the supervillain Morlin returns from the dead to kill Spider-Man. And at this point in the story, Spidey is weakened, leaving him vulnerable to some more gruesome beatdowns such as this one. Morlin basically catches up to Spider-Man and beats him up within an inch of his life, and before taking off, gouges out Spidey's left eye and devours it right in front of him, saying, mmm, delicious. It's a state we're not used to seeing Peter Parker in, so beaten down and dismembered like this, so I figured it had to go on the list. At number 9 is the time when Spidey gets buried alive by Kraven. This devastating moment takes place in the Kraven's last hunt storyline when Kraven tracks down and shoots Spider-Man, seemingly killing him and then burying him in a grave on the grounds of his mansion. When the job seems to be done, Kraven then takes on the mantle of Spider-Man himself and terrorizes New York as a much more violent and unforgiving version of the hero. Luckily, Spider-Man wakes up after some troubling nightmares, realizing that he had only been tranquilized all along. He gets to Craven and takes him down, but still needs to face the challenge of rebuilding his damaged reputation. At number 8 is the horribly infamous event of, trigger warning, Spider-Man and Mary Jane losing their baby in the late stages of pregnancy. Luckily, it's later revealed that the baby was actually born happy and healthy, but had been stolen 
by Norman Osborn. However, they don't know that and neither do the readers for a while. Before this strange twist is revealed, we're left with one of the darker moments in Spider-Man franchise history and it's no picnic. It really puts an otherwise invulnerable neighborhood hero and of course Mary Jane herself in a very shocking and very real crisis. And not to mention, it leads to the beginning of the decline of Peter and Mary Jane's marriage altogether. That Norman Osborn really plays hardball on the psychological game, doesn't he? At number seven, we have the time when Ultimate Spider-Man dies. In the second volume of the Ultimate storyline, launched in the year 2009, the Earth 1610 Peter Parker is behind the Ultimate Spider-Man mask. And on one fateful day, he actually loses his battle against the Green Goblin and the rest of the Sinister Six. Between issues 156 and 160, we see Spider-Man face off against a group of brutal bad guys, mostly right in front of Aunt May and Mary Jane. The whole time he's met with so much firepower that he even needs Aunt May to step in at one point with a revolver, taking out Electro before he's able to finish off Peter himself. What's most devastating about this moment is that this isn't even some older, more mature iteration of Spider-Man. He's just a teenager when this happens. And when he dies, it just leaves a mark that stays with you. Good thing Miles Morales is there to take over for him, but it still doesn't fully soften the blow of what happens. At number six, we have the time when a zombie Spider-Man eats Aunt May and Mary Jane. On Earth 2149, there happens to be a virus that has taken over all the Marvel heroes, turning them into zombies. And that, of course, includes Peter Parker. And before he knows he's infected, he swings back home to warn Aunt May and Mary Jane about the infection. But while he's there, he succumbs to the virus himself and goes feral killing Mary Jane first, and then turning on Aunt May. But this isn't any typical zombie infection. Spider-Man is totally sentient and knows exactly what's going on while he's doing it. He just can't control himself. So, in the moment when he turns on Aunt May, he's actually warning her to leave the room, knowing that he's gonna end up turning on her if she doesn't. It's brutal. Number five, meet Daddy Nightcrawler. Probably one of the weirdest storylines we have ever had in comics happens to be one where we learned about the truth behind who Nightcrawler's father was. Did we need to know this? Did we really care about this? I mean, Kurt already had an adoptive family who are admittedly pretty cool, and he's got Mystique for a mom, which might not be as cool in terms of like Mystique being a good mom, but it's definitely interesting. But we also, I guess, had to give him a dad to help explain even more the way Nightcrawler looks and his powers. In a storyline where demonic mutants known as Neofem were pitted against angelic mutants known as Chaofim, implying that mutants are related to both heaven and hell, or at least some of them are, we learned that Azazel is a powerful, satanic-like, demonic being who was actually Nightcrawler's father. And it only sired him in an attempt to free himself and his fellow Neofem from the Brimstone Dimension where they were trapped. Number four, Necrotia. The massacre at Genosha, which we talked about on part one, was really bad. But even worse, it also paved the way for another tragic event when Necrotia happened. Tragic, scary, is a lot of things. Necrotia was when Selene of the Externals, not to be confused with Marvel's Eternals, who are a totally different thing, decided to make her home base the devastated Genosha. Selene ended up taking control of all the dead left on Genosha, resurrecting them, and utilizing them as an undead army to attack the new mutant island of Utopia. Yeah, it was pretty bad. Not only does Selene seek to get revenge on the X-Men either, and also conquer Utopia, but her plan here is to basically become a bona fide goddess who would be uh, pretty dangerous and scary indeed. Number three, Inferno from 2021. During the most recent Inferno event, a lot of truths were unearthed about the true allegiances of those who came together to create Krakoa, and just exactly who was behind the whole mutant island paradise. Now, we already knew that story, but not all mutants, in fact, not many mutants, did. The truth was that the idea of what Krakoa is was founded by Magneto and Professor X, as well as their ally and friend, Moira McTaggart, who we recently found out during the House of X series was actually a mutant. Moira claimed she wanted to help her fellow mutants, but in reality, she planned to actually end mutant kind, which is what's revealed in Inferno. But instead of destroying them, she wanted to disguise her destruction in the guise of a mutant paradise, kind of giving them like one last hurrah as they would eventually die out, as per her plan. During Inferno, Moira's betrayal was brought to light, and she was exiled from Krakoa. Number two, Mutant Massacre. 
Now sometimes referred to as the Morlock Massacre, but back in the day it was simply known as the Mutant Massacre. This was before massive mutant attacks like Genosha ever happened. Which is also what made this so much more shocking and horrible at the time. Although it happened on a smaller scale, the Mutant Massacre happened when Mr. Sinister in essence ordered the Morlocks be eradicated. He sent his team of marauders to handle them and attack, killing many who lived down in the sewers. It was, as it is called, a mutant massacre. For those unfamiliar, the Morlocks are less pretty mutants basically. Ones who have dramatic physical mutations which often make it impossible for them to walk among humans on the surface world, at least without going unnoticed. So they tend to stick to their own kind and the sewers. Think the sewer mutants from Futurama, it's kind of what they're like. Morlocks as such sometimes are considered more antagonistic mutants who resent the mutants sometimes who are able to walk freely among men. Now, not all Morlocks are like that and in reality for the most part they're actually peaceful and innocent folks who have been even more ostracized and rejected from the world than most other mutants. So they definitely didn't deserve to be massacred. It was really, really awful. Number 1. M-Day M-Day has to have been one of the worst moments in mutant history. Although I actually gave Genosha the top spot on the, my part 1 of this list, that's because, I mean, I pretty much always talk about M-Day, we don't usually talk about Genosha, and I wanted to save that for a potential part 2, which I figured was coming, and here it is. Decimation is by far one of the worst things to have ever happened to mutant kind. Genosha simply doesn't get enough acknowledgement because it ended up being overshadowed by the devastation of M Day, which happened only a few years later, with M Day happening in 2005 and the massacre at Genosha happening in 2001. M Day happened as a result of Scarlet Witch striking out at mutant kind after the events of House of M, where she attempted to create a reality where many heroes were happy, but after learning of its falseness, was once again rejected by all those she had basically tried to help. Namely, though, Wanda was striking out at her then to be believed father, Magneto, who she claimed loved mutant kind more than he did his own family. Wanda said the words no more mutants and with with that small utterance, depowered or destroyed millions of mutants the world over. Number 10. Hulk Smash? X-Men? This happened during World War Hulk. Hulk had been sent to Sakaar and believed that the Illuminati were not only responsible for sending him off world, but also for destroying the planet that he had made his new home and his future family there as well. Coming back to Earth and pissed, he began to hunt down all members of the Illuminati, including those who weren't even at the meeting. Enter Charles Xavier. While Charles was not one of the members to condemn the Hulk as he was not in attendance, Hulk still wanted to know what Charles would have voted had he been there. Charles told him the truth, that he also would have voted to send Hulk off world. Hulk wanted to hold Charles accountable for what he saw as his potential crimes, since you know, Charles didn't actually vote, but before he could take him away, the X-Men stepped in to defend the professor. Hulk then began to beat down any and all mutants or allies who would stand in his way. It was a slaughter. All this despite the fact that Charles wasn't even there, and these mutants really didn't have a say in the matter of Hulk being sent off world to begin with. In the end, Hulk was shamed into stopping his attack and leaving Xavier B by the mutant Mercury. Thank goodness. Number 9. Schism Schism isn't necessarily a bad idea on paper, but it was one of the darkest moments in X-Men history. So in a way, it was the worst for the mutants themselves, in terms of in canon, as opposed to, you know, us readers. What went down here? Well, Cyclops and Wolverine fought and created a huge split down the middle between mutant kind, especially mutant students, as each had their own beliefs when it came to as how best to shape these young minds. What might seem odd about Schism is that it was about a divide between Cyclops Psych and Wolvie, who are not really known for being super friendly anyways due to their infighting about, you know, who should get a date Jean Grey. However, it should also be noted that Cyclops and Wolverine, despite both loving Jean, are actually considered to be pretty close and are good friends. That is until they get into a disagreement about how best to teach young mutants. Like I said, they've gotten into a lot of disagreements before that, but this one was pretty big. Wolverine thinks that they should be treated as kids, and Cyclops thinks they should be trained as soldiers. What makes it worse is just as a sentinel attacks the mutant island of Utopia, Cyclops and Wolverine decided to fight one another over the differentiating standpoints as opposed to dealing with the sentinels. Which is, I mean, I know you guys are having a fight, but like, a sentinel's attacking? I feel like we should deal with that first. Number 8. Cyclops recruits X-23 for X-Force X-Force is a team that is sometimes referred to as the X-Men Black Ops team. They go in and do the jobs that others are not willing to do. The more shady and morally questionable heroic stuff. 
X-Force originally started as Cable's team that went around dealing with situations and taking out people that basically Cable thought needed to be handled, but from there would evolve into a secret X-Men team that handled assassinations and less desirable jobs. At one point, it's Cyclops who puts the team together during the mutants time on Utopia. He appoints Wolverine the leader, but also puts X-23 on the team against Logan's wishes. This is because X-23, Laura Kinney, has only known killing pretty much her whole life. She was made to be a weapon and Logan wanted her to have a say moving forward in what she did with her life. He didn't want her to have to feel like she always had to be a weapon. She could be more than that. But Cyclops feels she's too useful to not have on the team. Needless to say, it was not a good look for Psych and Logan was pretty pissed. Number 7. The First Live Action Juggernaut While the version of Juggernaut from the Deadpool franchise appears relentless in a really great way, the first attempt at the character on screen was not so great. Even the actor that played Juggernaut in the Fox X-Men franchise, Vinnie Jones, appearing in X-Men The Last Stand, supposedly claimed he was even disappointed with the betrayal as well. The problem with this version of Juggy was that he wasn't really intimidating enough. Also, that outfit. I don't think it works great on camera. If it weren't for the Juggernaut's displays of easily smashing through walls, I feel like we'd have a hard time recognizing him here, even with him clearly stating who he is to the audience while he's in pursuit of Kitty Pride. Number 6. Inhumans vs X-Men Possibly one of the weirdest storylines we've ever gotten, especially as Inhumans were kind of attempted to be utilized before in the comics to be like a backup to the X-Men. Not saying I don't love the Inhumans by the way, but after Marvel sold the rights of the X-Men to Fox, they basically made an attempt to kind of catapult the Inhumans into popularity and that really just didn't work out too well. The Inhumans were made by the Kree and were modified humans who basically get powers through a process called Terrigenesis, where they're exposed to Terrigen Mists. They usually keep to themselves, so to have them fight any mutant group feels kind of weird straight out of the gate. The reasoning between them and the X-Men having Beef? Well, it turns out that apparently Terrigen Mists are like poison to mutant kind, and despite the Inhumans attempting to work things out and come to some kind of peaceful resolution when mutant kind were accidentally hurt by mists released on Earth because they actually felt pretty bad about it, the two groups ended up in a war. What makes it even worse is that the catalyst for this war, the dramatic death of Cyclops at the hands, or rather the voice, of Black Bolt, is revealed to have been staged by Emma Frost to give mutants a reason to fight back against a group that never really wanted to fight to begin with. So what are we even talking about here? Number 5. Lack of Sabretooth Sabretooth has always been a pretty terrifying dude. He ain't nice, he's extremely violent and extremely hard to bring down. And even more so in the Ultimate Universe, he becomes bonded with adamantium similar to Wolverine and even has retractable bone claws out of his forearms, also like Wolverine. Doesn't really need them as he also eventually has his naturally occurring claws on each fingertip as well as his fangs and teeth laced with adamantium to just bump up the amount of absolutely bloody carnage he could produce. If this sounds awesomely terrifying, it's because it is, which makes it a shame when he doesn't really do much. Sabretooth in the Ultimate Universe, similar to 616, is kind of just a lackey to Weapon X and then later to Magneto. It just feels wrong to make such an imposing villain more imposing but not give him much to do. Number 4. Sabretooth vs Angel Oh actually there is one thing of note here that Sabretooth does. One thing that was incredibly brutal and unnecessary in true Ultimate Universe fashion. In the aftermath of Magneto's ultimatum wave, he and Sabretooth waited in the Arctic for the heroes to come and try to apprehend them in Ultimatum issue number 4 from 2009. The first to arrive was Warren Worthington III, or Angel, who came crashing through a window with a punch straight to Magneto's big old face. But after Magneto gave the go ahead, Sabretooth pounced at the crash landed mutant, scratching the living hell out of his back, tore off one of his wings with his teeth, seeming to enjoy the brief cannibalism, and then stomped on Warren's neck with his boot, taking out the mutant in another of the Ultimate Universe's unceremonious dispatching of a fan loved character. Thanks Ultimate Universe! Thank you so much. Number 3. Dormammu and Doctor Strange Speaking of unceremonious dispatching, Angel wasn't the only hero to meet his end in issue number 4 of Ultimatum. Right at the beginning of the comic, it seems that the Hulk's rampaging has led to Doctor Strange's Sanctum Sanctorum, and he begins just smashing everything, including magical items which results in a blinding flash of light. Next thing we know, the dread Dormammu is free from the dark dimension and is in magical conflict with Doctor Strange. But Dormammu 
seems more than confident that he won't be defeated by the sorcerer. It takes merely a few pages before Dormammu uses the Sorcerer Supreme's own sash, belt, cloak thingy, constricting it around Strange's body so tightly that it explodes his head in an extremely grotesque couple of panels that I'm not sure we're even allowed to show. Just like that, the normally extremely powerful Dr. Stephen Strange is out of the picture. Number 2. Hawkeye's Family Tragedy Say what you will about the ultimate version of Clint Barton. He is much less heroic than his 616 counterpart, he is a S.H.I.E.L.D. sponsored killer, and he is much more of a secret agent. Ultimately. He is the basis for the MCU's version of the character. From his look to his family. But what the Ultimate Universe did to his family, or more specifically what Black Widow did to them, I should say, will likely never be seen in the MCU, which we should all thank our lucky stars for. As we talked about all the way up at the 10th point, Natalia Romanova did not turn out to be a great gal. She was working for the Liberators, a group of heroes from around the globe who were opposed to the amount of power held by the United States thanks to S.H.I.E.L.D. and the Ultimates. It was a cool, realistic concept, and one that could have opened up the comics to more worldwide inclusiveness. Instead it was kind of just a way to make America seem superior. After Natalia's revelation as a traitor, she organized the assassination of her longtime Black Ops partner, Hawkeye's entire family, even personally taking out his son Callum. For her crimes, Clint does put an arrow between her eyes in Ultimates 2's final chapter as she is in a hospital bed thanks to Tony Stark giving her brain damage. It doesn't really help the whole situation. And in at number one, Peter Parker comes back to life. One of the key things about the Ultimate Universe was supposed to be its realism, or at least its realism in a universe full of superheroes, sorcerers, gods, and monsters. One of the aspects of said realism was the fact that death would be permanent, which is about as real as you can get. The only problem was that didn't seem to last. One of the best things about the Ultimate Universe was Ultimate Spider-Man. It's regarded as not only the best thing out of that universe, but one of the best Spider-Man stories ever told. His eventual death after saving many people in Ultimatum, taking a bullet for Captain America, and then fighting and defeating Norman Osborn and the Six was equally as amazing if not tragic and emotional. It also paved the way for another one of the Ultimate Universe's best, Miles Morales. So in order to make that amazing story and all the emotional weight it had going for it mean absolutely nothing, what do you know, Peter Parker wakes up in some underground laboratory, seemingly revived. Yay! 